Hello, everyone. I uh, hope all of you are staying safe. I will be talking today about medical nutrition therapy for pregnancy with diabetes. Just to introduce myself a little bit, my name is Geeta. I'm a registered dietitian and also a diabetes educator, what we call now the CDCES. And I work for Vita Healthcare in Houston, Texas. So we've got a, quite a lot of things to cover today. And I uh, just wanted to uh, talk a little bit. This webinar is considered a resource, but not uh, does not define the standard of care in California. And uh, I have nothing to disclose here. So the, to go over the objectives, um, just wanted to highlight these objectives. The first one being understand the goals of medical nutrition therapy, uh, review appropriate, weight gain goals, uh, discuss preconception and prenatal energy needs, and identify macro and micronutrient needs during pregnancy. Now, to give you a little bit of a background information, um, diabetes during pregnancy is defined as any degree of glucose intolerance during pregnancy, and it does affect approximately about 10% of uh, pregnant women. And there are 200,000 cases diagnosed each year. So the women who have GDM have about a 20 to 50 percent chance of developing type 2 diabetes in the next five to 10 years. Now, talking the main, uh, main component, medical nutrition therapy, which I would say is one of the key components of glycemic control. So I'm going to expand. Uh, a lot more on this as we go along. So the goals of uh, medical nutrition therapy. Uh, so I would be abbreviating that as an MNT as we go on. Uh, individualized balanced meal plan. So one of the things I always kind of uh, focus on is we want to make sure that we do get patients who are uh, come from different cultural background, different needs. So individualizing the meal plan always helps for a better outcome and uh, making sure that it's evidence based recommendations and for adequate fetal and maternal health, maternal nutrition, and also addressing vitamin and mineral supplementation as needed. Uh, also talking about appropriate weight gain. So one of the things when we talk about appropriate, making sure that it's not only monitoring weight gain during pregnancy, but also looking at the rate of weight gain. So I know we do talk a lot about pre-pregnancy weight uh, and pre during pregnancy weight, but it's also the rate of weight gain, or it could be weight loss. So that's, that's what we're gonna address as one of the goals. The other one being normal glycemia, and the last one being promotion and support of breastfeeding. Now the preconception weight goals. Um, all women are encouraged to achieve a reasonable weight before conception. So uh, there is a strong connection between uh, weight started at before pregnancy and outcome and outcomes. Of course, the weight and amount of weight gain during pregnancy is um, as important, but one of the things that we always um, talk about is uh, if you had patients early on or if you've been following up with patients way before um, pregnancy, they've been coming to you for preconception, one of the things probably we want to emphasize is uh, to achieving that uh, reasonable weight before pregnancy for a better outcome. And the other goal for preconception is a, a, we are using the preconception BMI in determining the weight category. Um, and um, many a times uh, we you know, ask the patients if they have no idea about their weight or height. So uh, basically, if you got the height, it's just kind of trying to figure out as to what, is, what could be a good starting point for that. Now, determining a preconception BMI. So you can see on the screen the uh, formula for that. It's it's pretty clear, and you can do it this way. Or there are not so many um, you know apps and the wheels that you can see that kind of determines the BMI. 
Uh, but the BMI, basically, if you look at that, it's a weight in pounds times 703 divided by height squared in inches. Or it could be a weight in kilograms divided by height squared in meters. Now, the body mass index are all the weight gain goals. Uh, so you see in this neat little table, it tells you the category uh, for uh, weight, weight gain goals, the first one being underweight. And you can see the corresponding BMIs to that. And to the extreme right, you see the recommended weight, total weight gain ranges for singleton and twins. So the underweight, as you see, are for the singleton 28 to 40 pounds, but there's not enough data documented for the twin category. So you'll have to use your judgment at that call to see if the uh, uh, pregnant woman is um, gaining adequate uh, weight, is she getting adequate nutrition, and also based on ultrasound results as to the uh, growth is, fetal growth is happening okay. Uh, and you see the other categories, normal, uh, being uh, 25 to 35 for singleton and 37 to 54 for twins, overweight being 15 to 25 pounds for singleton and 31 to 50 pounds for twins, and the obese category, uh, a singleton about 11 to 20 pounds and 25 to 42 pounds. Most of the time I have, um, you know, either, you know, the patients or the, uh, you know, providers asking me is like, um, can I tell them not to get any, any weight because they're being obese to start with? But this is one of the things we want to make sure that although they are in the obese category, we want to make sure they're gaining at least minimal uh, weight, at least a minimal of 11 pounds to uh, support fetal growth. And obviously, you see many times when you start with the MNT and the obese category, they start changing the way they eat, they tend to lose weight because they die ways and they're eliminating all the empty calories. And it is okay as long as the two weeks past MNT, you, you see them start to gain some weight. To, um, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the weight gain in this category as we go on. So you see this table, again, the recommended weight of weight gain per week uh, based on the same categories. And you can see the extreme right, the mean range in pounds per week for singletons. And um, I'm not going to explain uh, everything, but you can see it's very self-explanatory. But um, touching base on what I would see at the obese category. So the mean range in pounds per week is about at least a 0.5 pounds per week. And the range uh, and, you know, being range being about 0.4 to 0.6. Now, the weight gain grids are, um, you know, feel free. Those forms are located at the CDAP website, and it's all listed in here. Uh, the, the grids are there for the normal uh, category, underweight, normal, overweight, and obese category. Uh, so it's kind of nice to you. There are some, some of the places I've seen these are embedded in the EMR which could be a good way to show it to the patients as well if when you're counseling. Or sometimes you are having the paper chart, it's, it's a good one to have in the file. So you can actually, the patients can actually um, track the grow, uh, progress of, you know, the weight gain or weight loss as, for, as, as well as for the providers. It gives a very clear picture. I would highly encourage um, uh, providers to look into this. Now, the preconception energy needs. Uh, energy needs are based on preconception weight. And like I said, many of the times when we get the patients, they're already in the second trimester, so that's okay. So whenever they kind of, um, you see them at the first visit is that's when you are basing, basing their energy needs. Uh, calculate the energy needs using the IOM, the Institute of Medicine Estimated Energy Requirement Formula, which is the EER formula, which I'm going to go over in a bit. So this is the EER formula that you're looking at. Um, I know I'm not going to go through every formula, but you can see it's categorized into two different groups, the 14 to 18 years old and the 19 years or older. Um, so you can see there are certain abbreviations there. Uh, so there are two different formulas for the 
two different sets for the different group age groups a being for age in years and pa being the physical activity coefficient and weight in kilograms and height in uh, meters now physical activity coefficient so if you look at the extreme left is the activity level because you know the energy needs truly depends on how much of the activity is coming in so the more active you are the energy needs kind of go up so also we have added this physical activity coefficient which can be used so again the categories are 14 to 18 years this uh, second category being more than 19 years uh, so extreme left you can see the categories activity level being sedentary which is like physical activity if it's a small you know kind of a stroll small little walk uh, it's being 1.04 the 14 to 18 years category and one for the more than 19 years category moderate activity is defined as 30 minutes of moderate intense physical activity uh, at, which is 1.16 for 14 to 18 category and 1.12 for the 19 and above category. The activity, the last one listed is the ACTA, which is about 60 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity, which could be like running or swimming many laps or, you know, kind of fast walking and jogging kind of a thing. Um, so that could be about 1.56 for the 14 to 18 years category and 1.45 for more than 19 years category. Now, this is one of the things that a lot of issues come up and people ask me a lot of questions about the excessive pregnancy weight gain. So excessive pregnancy weight gain is associated with increased risk of macrosomia among, among women and all of us kind of know this. So like I said, this is one of the issues a lot of us deal with, a lot of the providers deal with. So understanding the energy needs during pregnancy would greatly help with um, tackling this kind of issues. Now, uh, I'm going to spend a little more time on this energy needs, the prenatal energy needs. So if you are looking up, I mean, everybody must have come across the thoughts from patients about pregnancy and nutrition. You know, when they're coming in, they say, oh, I was told I need to eat for two. And that is what is thought to be the goal. But most of us uh, get uh, patients already in well in second trimester, but, uh, you know, but if you have a patient early into care, um, so you might want to uh, emphasize uh, at that point the needs during every trimester. So the eating for the two, when people actually start eating literally for two, that's when as a lot of energy comes in, calories come, come in, and um, you see a lot of weight gain happening at that point, and the sugar levels could start going up. So emphasizing uh, that the first trimester, which is from zero to 12 to 13 weeks, um, energy needs remain the same as preconception. So on an average, total daily energy expenditure um, does not change during the first trimester. Uh, so uh, at an average increase of body weight of 3.2 kilograms. So studies have shown that uh, adjusted total daily energy expenditure declines, in fact, by 55 calories per day from uh, pre-pregnancy until 13 weeks of gestation, which is primarily the first trimester. So the second and the third trimester uh, is when the energy needs start to uh, go up. Um, so the energy needs, uh, energy intake requirements in pregnancy actually match the demands of resting metabolism, physical activity, and the tissue growth. So the energy balance in pregnancy is therefore defined as energy intake equal to energy expenditure plus energy storage. So on an average, total uh, energy expenditure increases by approximately 15 calories per day per week or by 420 calories per day from pre-pregnancy to delivery. So uh, in the second the third trimester, that's where you actually want to start, uh, you know, calculating the needs for the pregnant woman who comes in to see you. So the total daily energy expenditure um, in second and third trimester is known to increase approximately, I would say, by 18 calories per day per week, or about 420 calories, like I said, from week um, 13 to 36, uh, at an average increase in body weight of 10.3 kilograms. So at 37 weeks, um, 
Uh, if uh, any one of you have seen the popular you know, graph, which shows that the insulin need kind of drops down a little bit because the placental hormones tends to clear or taper off from the body because the, your body is getting ready to deliver the baby. At that point, you don't see the needs of the same as it was until 36 weeks, meaning it does not mean in any way that the women should stop eating the extra calories or they should stop testing the sugars or you know, um, uh, they, uh, uh, they might stop taking the insulin. But only thing it means that women at that point can ease out a little bit. So if they didn't provide as much of a walk after a meal, or if they had a little, maybe five, 10 extra grams of carb, um, and that it still might look okay because the placental hormones are tapering and those who are on insulin probably might not need as much insulin and they might have to adjust the dose of insulin based on the sugars at that point. So the energy needs for pregnancy, again, based on the gestational aid, the IOM formula to calculate uh, for the needs for pregnant women who have normal weight pre-gravid is a simple formula is now that we learned how to calculate the EER. So the first trimester is the adult EER plus zero calories. As we know, the first trimester, the energy needs are not great. The second trimester uh, is when you see the ad adult EER, you add that 160 calories. So what you're looking at when you, uh, uh, when you break it down is eight calories per week times 20 weeks plus 180 calories. So that's that's how it's um, subdivided or calculated. The third trimester is the adult EER plus 272 calories, which is eight calories per week times 34 weeks uh, plus 180 calories, right? So like I said, 34 until 36 you could do because the calories kind of needs can go up a little bit, but you've seen some women actually their sugar start to drop by the end of 35, and they tend to be a little more insulin sensitive. So now the energy needs um, may require adjustments during pregnancy based on blood glucose values, uh, ketone levels, and uh, weight gain parameters. So the caloric needs have to be really tailored to the patient needs. So, um, you know, when you start seeing um, a lot of weight loss, probably that's where you need to start having the patients test a little bit more of the ketone levels the first two weeks. Usually the first two weeks of MNT would be a good time to check for the ketone levels, but it's not necessary or mandatory. Uh, but if someone is having um, a lot of weight loss issues, that's probably a good way to check the ketone. But the needs are totally dependent on these parameters. Now, the research uh, findings suggest that inflammatory um, cytokines, such as C-reactive protein, which you call a CRP, are associated with obesity and consequently increased risk of insulin resistance, uh, diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. And also some of the research suggests that obesity, we all know this, like obesity uh, maybe uh, is an independent, I would say, a risk factor for preterm uh, birth. And also obesity does increase rates of medical complications that have been shown to contribute to uh, preterm births. Now, the energy needs for overweight and obese women. This is one of the other topics that a lot of us kind of um, struggle with and want to know more about as to what exactly would be the energy needs. How do we uh, allocate how many calories for uh, the women in this, this category? So there's no consensus on determining energy needs for uh, overweight or an obese pregnant woman at this point, but I would say a minimum start uh, if they're coming to you, um, you know, most of the time they come, you know, if you, the patients are coming to you in the second trimester to start with 1800 calories for adequate nutrition. So um, typically when you, the women come to you with diagnosed with gestational diabetes, they're so fearful of having so many carbs. 
uh, or calories, so they probably would have already cut it down to maybe 1,500 or so. So if they come to you at the first trimester and they're 1,500 calories, which is probably more appropriate, but the second and th third trimester on, we want to definitely focus on a minimum 1,800 calories for adequate nutrition um, and definitely based on a single thumb. But if somebody uh, came in with the you know, twin or triplets, you definitely want to bump up the um, uh, caloric requirements at the point. Now, you have to be really careful about um, monitoring it clinically to ensure adequate um, intake. Uh, but restricting usual caloric intake by about 30 to 33 percent in obese pregnant women have has been demonstrated to prevent macrosomia without uh, spilling significant amounts of ketones in the urine. So I think at this point it's like um, using your own judgment call to see where uh, the obese uh, pregnant woman started the pregnancy with and how she goes about with the rate of weight gain, how is she doing with her um, sugar level. So I would say, I usually tell patients, if you started with a diet plan, it's not a golden plan that goes on till the end of the pregnancy. There could be a lot of tweaks and adjustment based on the parameters that we just uh, talked about. Now, our calories, so the, one of the easier way to calculate the calories are calories based on the ideal body weight. So if, um, you know, many a times we have our patients coming, like usually typically if you had a one hour consultation for the new patient, and, and you know, as, as, as normal, sometimes, you know, you see the patients coming in late and you end up with only 30 minutes or 40 minutes for the new appointments. So this is one of the easier ways to quick calculate and just to kind of a, uh, get an idea, to get started the uh, women with. And once you get more uh, into uh, more follow-ups, you can go into more detailed calculations. But this is a pretty good start. So I would say a 30 grams, a 30 calories per a kilogram of body weight for normal BMI and 24 calories per kilogram body weight for uh, someone who's overweight and 12 to 15 calories per uh, kilogram body weight for the obese uh, category. Now the macronutrient recommendations during pregnancy. So uh, what are the macros? We're talking about the carbs, protein and fats. So the calories gradually increase, as we all know, from 13 plus weeks, which is the first trimester. Uh, the protein uh, being the 1.1, uh, we look at the 1.1 grams per kilogram per day, or an additional 25 grams per day from the second trimester on. And the DRI for carbohydrates is about a minimum of uh, 130 grams per day in the first trimester, and 175 grams per day in the second and the third trimester. Uh, like I said, many of the women are so fearful of the sugars going up, so you will not probably see them at 175. Usually, I have seen in my experience anywhere from, I think, uh, uh, 150 or 140. So you really have to work as providers to slowly bring them up to the recommended amount that we talk about for uh, the 175. Uh, but like I said, many a times, uh, based on the parameters, you could probably be doing 160 grams of carbs for the whole day. But as long as the sugars are looking good, uh, the woman is gaining um, weight and the fetus is growing really well, I think that's okay to be at 160 or a little less than 175. But this is what we recommend uh, per day in the second and third trimester. And talking about fat, we're a little bit liberal with fat uh, during pregnancy. Uh, I'll focus on um, about um, monounsaturated fats as the main source. So typically we tend to go like at least like a 40% of the carbs, 40 to 45, but 40 works good of the total calories coming from carbs. Then maybe about 35 to 40 coming from carbs and 20 to 25% coming from protein. But this is what the numbers we fall back on. So fat becomes more important for, especially for someone who is coming in pre-existing diabetes. So talking a lot about uh, with dyslipidemia, so talking a lot about the good and the bad fats with, make up a lot of difference. 
so also focusing that because we're a little liberal with fat during pregnancy does not mean that uh, uh, women can consume a lot of fat, uh, which can accumulate a lot of um, calories and in turn start um, you know having issues with their weight gain. Now fiber. Um, is recommendation is about 25 to six, uh, 25 to 35 grams per day, uh, encouraging more um, vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, anything other than corn, peas, potatoes, and the squashes, those starchy vegetables uh, to get more fiber and uh, also fruits, um, two to three fruits per day. So encouraging that per day so that it helps them with the sugar as well as the steady weight gain. And sodium, um, so one of the things we talk about is the adequate intake, which is the AI, abbreviated as AI. For women under 50 years is about 1.5 grams per day, which is about 1,500 milligrams per day. The upper limit is about 2.3 grams per day, which is 2,300 milligrams per day. And the patients with hypertension and nephropathy, no more than two grams or 2,000 milligrams of sodium per day. And now, uh, talking about uh, folic acid. So folic acid, what we're looking at uh, preconception is about 400 micrograms per day preconception. And pre-pregnancy is 600 micrograms per day. And uh, someone with history of neural tube defect um, would be a 4,000 micrograms per day. So uh, someone with a uh, history of neural tube defect, we recommend, the recommendation is to increase their daily supplement to 4,000 micrograms per day, one month prior to conception and throughout uh, the first three months of pregnancy. And our unless there's something different that their OBs have recommended them. So the upper tolerable limit uh, categorized into two, the two categories is 14 to 18 years old is about 800 micrograms per day and the 19 to 50 years old uh, 1000 micrograms per day. So I've had in my experience like a 14 year old pregnancies. Yes, uh, we do see that. But I have seen even past 50 years, I think my in my experience, my um, yeah, working time, I had one woman who was 53 or almost like 54 where she got pregnant. You know, that's one of the times when you think that, oh, I have a little bit of insulin resistance and they're taking metformin and they ovulate and they get pregnant. So um, uh, we would still would say probably a thousand micrograms per day. So don't be surprised with the age groups. Now, the uh, vitamin D uh, is a very important uh, micronutrient during pregnancy. Uh, it's uh, mainly for bone health and also helps with the uh, glycemic control. The RDA recommended daily allowance for pregnancy and lactation based on IOM report is uh, 600 international units per day, which is 15 micrograms per day. The upper tolerable limit for pregnancy and lactation is 4,000 international units per day. So although the vitamin D does a lot of good things for pregnancy, for the glycemic control, for the bone health, uh, we don't want to overdose this because vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. It stays back in your system. It accumulates to a toxic level and there are high risk of also kidney stone formation. So, um, so we want to focus to make sure we're talking to them about the upper limit for uh, pregnancy and lactation, unless there's a different population, which I'm going to touch base, like a bariatric patients with post bariatric surgery, uh, they would follow the recommendations based on the surgeon and the OBGYN. So now to continue more, a little more with the uh, vitamin D, uh, there's so much controversy or arguments on what is considered as an optimal uh, you know, blood level of uh, you know, vitamin D. So IOM recommends that uh, suggestion is um, 20 uh, nanograms per milliliter uh, uh, is sufficient for good bone health. So uh, the enhanced data shows from 2010 that at least 
33% of pregnant women deficient in vitamin D, uh, where they were targeted as deficient based on the um, target of uh, reference range of 20 nanograms per milliliter as a target. So uh, especially if you have a lot of Asian population, I know they're routinely skin, uh, screened for the vitamin D because the absorption by the skin is not that great compared to the other population. So this is one of the important elements that we want to look at in the lab during or before pregnancy. Now calcium is very important too. So um, talking about the RDA recommended daily allowance for uh, uh, pre-pregnancy, pregnancy lactation. So you can see it is categorized again into the two groups, the 14 to 18 years old. Uh, the pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, pregnancy uh, recommendation for calcium being the 1300 milligrams per day and uh, uh, 19 to 50 years old being 1000 milligrams per day. So the upper tolerable limit during pregnancy for the 14 to 18 years old is about 3000 milligrams per day and the tolerable upper limit during pregnancy and lactation for the 19 to 50 years old uh, being 2500 milligrams per day. Uh, we always want to push the dietary sources, so uh, making sure you talk to them about the foods which are high in calcium and, if, po if possible, provide them with resources on that. Uh, most of the supplements do have about at least about 600 um, milligrams um, uh, in, in them, so um, the maximum absorption, what we've seen doing calcium, so any anything for med in that matter, like meals or medications or vitamins, spacing is the key. So the maximum absorption happens, we're seeing with calcium when you space it. So typically like a 200 to 300 milligrams three times a day is best uh, with the um, absorption of calcium. Now the uh, folic acid, as you know, we talked about it's 600, uh, you know, micrograms per day. The iron is about 30 uh, milligrams per day at first prenatal visit. Uh, so one of the things to know that women who are taking iron supplements more than 30 milligrams per day um, could uh, tend to have decreased absorption of zinc and uh, copper. So at that point, we, we recommend that any woman who's taking iron supplements more than 30 milligrams per day to add the extra 15 milligrams of zinc and two milligrams of uh, copper uh, per day. For vegans, uh, as you know, vegans, when they cut out obviously all the meats and other dairy products, they miss out on a lot of the zinc, which is an which important element in glycemic control and also in fetal growth. Uh, is, uh, recommendation is about 15 milligrams per day and um, 600 international units of vitamin D and two micrograms of vitamin B12. Uh, one of the things that I would want to say that someone who is on met, who's been in metformin especially and has been a vegetarian or a vegan for at least like a year or a couple of years uh, could tend to, uh, although we've seen more of this data in the elderly patients, but someone who has been as the duration of um, a time they've been on metformin and being a vegetarian or a vegan, they tend to uh, be deficient in B12. So, uh, so paying special attention to uh, vegans or vegetarians and making sure they're getting enough of the vitamin B12. Now, other substances during pregnancy. Um, so we're talking about caffeine, herbs, and eggs, and uh, other kind of deli meats. So if you're looking at coffee, um, anything with caffeine, the recommendation is limited to 200 milligrams per day, which is about two to six ounce cups of coffee. And this, I'm not talking about like a Starbucks coffee. It's like a general brewed at home. And um, studies have shown that 200 milligrams per day is still okay during pregnancy. And um, um, the, the herbs, uh, the safety is uh, unknown. But if a patient were to ask me uh, that, you know, I've been taking this herb for a long time before pregnancy, and it's really helped me, and I really don't want to quit that, what are your thoughts on that? So this is a question which puts you on spot. So I would normally say, you know what, um, respecting the, you know, the tradition and beliefs, 
I would say, um, you know, the herbs don't really have to go through uh, any um, uh, clinical FDA trials. And, and, you know, we don't know the safety and efficacy of that as much. So it's, uh, it's best to kind of limit any herbal teas or herbs. But at, some, at any point that you see that's interfering with your care or the glycemic uh, control, uh, at that point is when you want to stop um, using the herbs. Uh, so that way, um, you know, patients um, are much more uh, into managing their sugars than um, uh, if we provide more resistance in the beginning, they probably might back off from care. Um, so potentially um, contraindicated are ginkgo biloba, ginseng, echinacea, St. George's ward, and um, concentrated herbal garlic extract. Um, and uh, avoiding raw eggs, for example, for all the, you know, we're talking about um, E. coli, uh, listeria, there's a lot of things that we want to focus on during pregnancy, especially making sure avoiding raw sprouts, unpasteurized milk and cheeses, and cook all meat, fish, and poultry thoroughly. So some of the bacteria can actually um, survive in refrigeration temperatures, like the listeria. So you want to make sure at that point you are uh, talking to them about heating the meats until it's um, the uh, deli and luncheon meats until it's steaming. And also the drugs, uh, marijuana, opioids, all those, and alcohol. Uh, there's a, a, web, a website, um, uh, Teratogens, you know, the CTIS um, uh, website, which is listed in here. One of the things, obviously, we're going to tell them to avoid that, but if you see that uh, you have any of the patients who you suspect they're still kind of doing some drugs or any alcohol, um, you can provide this resource where they actually can talk to a live person rather than just kind of some, um, you know, resources or printed material over there. Now, the um, other substances to continue with that, the DHA and, um, and uh, other substances. Um, so DHA is found in wild fatty fish like salmon, herring, sardines, freshwater trout, and some fortified foods like milk, bread, and yogurt. Um, so like, like I said, we always push for dietary sources. And if the, uh, if you if they if the think or the uh, the provider thinks that the, she's not getting enough of DHA at that point a supplementation of at least 200 milligrams of DHA it could be suggested um, and several prenatal uh, supplements include DHA anyway uh, either from fish oil or other sources so one of the uh, so, you know studies suggested that supplementation with 3.4 grams per day of EPA and DHA for two to three weeks, weeks upregulates the gene expression. So avoiding, um, one of the things we wanna focus on is avoiding shark, swordfish, king mackerel and tilefish, uh, uh, touching on the mercury consumption. So you wanna talk to them about that. And um, there is a whole lot of list if you go into the FDA, um, uh, .gov. There's a whole list of that. You can print it out and give it to them. Uh, and focusing on the canned light tuna as less mercury than albacore tuna and uh, to avoid or limit to about six ounces per week of, uh, if you're looking at that. Now, non nutritive sweetness. Um, it's probably safe uh, with an acceptable, um, you know, daily intake, uh, like saccharin, uh, aspartame, neotame, sucralose, uh, and stevia, which is derived, uh, stevia derived sweeteners are generally um, uh, recognized as safe in this in the safe list, what we call the grass list. Um, so on stevia, there's insufficient evidence to use stevia in its whole herb uh, form. So um, um, if somebody's doing that, you want to kind of point that out. Now, agave, people ask me, what about agave? Um, you know, you see, um, you get the cases of agave in Costco or other places, and people like to use that. They've been told before pregnancy they could use that. Uh, I would say um, it is okay. First thing you want to explain to them that it, it, it is a carbohydrate caloric content. Um, it is similar to table sugar. And uh, it's sweeter than table sugar, possibly a uh, lower glycemic index. Uh, it's it's likely safe when consumed in small amounts, uh, not like you kind of um, 
uh, drinking up, you know, cups of it uh, and or using large amounts to bake something or do something. Uh, it's likely unsafe during pregnancy. Only thing uh, pre-pregnancy, if you've been doing that, uh, although it's been said that in small amounts, it's okay. But what the studies have shown that it's it could be okay, small, teeny tiny ones, but they also say that it's likely unsafe during pregnancy due to contraceptive effects um, that could lead to miscarriages. So what happens, so there's a lot of controversy around agave. Uh, the big thing about agave is that it contains a large number of saponins, uh, which are naturally occurring substances that can cause uterine um, contractions. So you definitely want to kind of, if someone using that, definitely want to emphasize on that, uh, not to scare them, but that could be a risk for uh, miscarriage due to that. So the sugar, alcohol, and polyol. So this is another area where a lot of the patients ask you for that. So some of the examples of sugar alcohols are sorbitol, mannitol, uh, xylitol, isomol. So anything I would say that it ends with uh, TOL pretty much could be a sugar alcohol. But you see the isomol and hydrogenated, um, you know, uh, hydrosylates, that is also um, one of the sugar uh, falls into this category. So it's generally recognized as safe. Um, it, uh, it has a reduced risk of dental caries, uh, although it has a um, laxative effect. So if you were to consume food product which has a lot of sugar alcohol in them, it could induce diarrhea. So you've got to be careful about that. So um, I'm going to go over, kind of uh, show how to read that in a food label in the next couple of slides. So when you look at the food sugar alcohol in a label, um, uh, half 50% of the sugar alcohol is absorbed by your body. So uh, so you have to, when you have sugar alcohol in the food label, you want to as uh, you know half the calories of uh, sucrose or sugar alcohol should be subtracted from the total grams of carb right so now looking at this um, label for example uh, so if you look at the extreme left uh, it tells you the the usual thing that we look at the serving sizes per container what is a serving size one cup and uh, calories is 160 then you're looking at uh, obviously the you know fat and the cholesterol and the sodium so we're talking about the sugar alcohol here so if you look at uh, the fiber we'll talk about the sugar alcohol and the fiber so the fiber what is high fiber so Usually when people look at the packet and it says high fiber food and they grab the packet, but when they flip at the back and they say, oh, it's got three grams of fiber, that's actually not a high fiber food. So anything that has five grams of fiber per serving is considered a high fiber food. So if you have a fiber, if the food contains about more than five grams or five grams of fiber, uh, which you see here um, now, uh, has about, um, three grams of fiber, so uh, which is a low fiber food. So uh, if you have more than five grams of fiber, so what you're doing is you're subtracting half of the grams of fiber from the carbohydrate grams to get the net grams of carb. For sugar alcohol, you kind of do the same thing. So if sugar alcohol, if food contains more than five grams of sugar alcohol, so here you can see it has 10 grams. Uh, subtract half of the grams of sugar alcohol from the carbs to get the total net carbs. So you actually here you see you have 21 grams of carb um, and you have 10 grams of alcohol. So you divide the 10 grams of alcohol by two. So meaning that five grams of sugar alcohol is actually absorbed by your body. So you take that five, subtract from the 21 grams of carbohydrate, then your net carbs are basically 16 grams for consuming this one cup of serving of whatever product this is, right? So, so that's how you want to emphasize, make sure that you kind of tell them that, yes, if you have large amounts of sugar alcohol, that is considered as starch and you have to calculate that. Might be especially very important when somebody's doing insulin to carb ratio and taking insulin or type one on pump or anything like that. Now, switching gears to uh, the sweet success, the sweet success nutrition guidelines for uh, GDM. Uh, a serving of carb uh, or a carbohydrate choice, I mean, a serving and a choice kind of is the same, is 15 grams. So what I say is 
uh, one serving of starch or the uh, has 15 grams of carb right so the key is to spread the carb load over three small meals and three small snacks so the carbs are uh, one of the things is uh, the carbs are not well tolerated at breakfast now this first thing in the morning you see there's a huge surge of placental hormones maybe anywhere from two o'clock three o'clock in the morning lasts for maybe eight eight thirty so but it's it's very pronounced in the morning so if you were to have the uh, 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 carbs uh, basically carbs are not very well tolerated but uh, out of that um, there are two uh, food groups which i'm jumping a little bit ahead of this topic is the milk the dairy and the uh, the fruits are not well tolerated by the placental hormones in the morning and that kind of can double and triple their numbers after breakfast so uh so but if somebody is on insulin, um, you, your carb intake can be very flexible. So you can base it on how many you know, units of insulin you need to cover for those carbs that you really wanna have. So avoiding fruits. So what I would say, uh, usually I say, try to avoid fruits at breakfast and preferably you can avoid milk at breakfast. That should be great. Uh, soy milk is perfectly fine. Almond milk, cashew milk, those are perfectly fine. It's the, the lactose, which is not well, well tolerated at breakfast time. So the fruits, no more than two or more servings uh, every day, not at breakfast. Uh, milk, about three to four servings every day and not recommended at breakfast. Uh, we talk about 2% or 1%. I generally don't tend to recommend non-fat because the more non-fat it gets to, the more processed it is. So I want I, I, I would rather want uh, women to stay away, people to stay away from more processed uh, foods. So a 1% or 2% should be a good, uh, good choice. Uh, so that could be portioned out in the size of four to eight ounces during meals or snacks. Now the uh, breads and starches as low as 15 to 20 grams at breakfast. I've seen people going as low as seven to 10, but I would really not recommend more, less than 10 grams. So if the indication of somebody is going to a bare minimum of seven grams of carb, that could be an indication that she would need um, um, she's extremely insulin resistant at that point and she probably needs some insulin to manage that because we don't want to keep cutting the carbs and compromise the nutritional status of um, the fetus and the mom as well. So, um, so 15 to 20 grams of uh, carbs at breakfast and a minimum of 7 grams of protein and 15 to 30 grams of carbs at a bedtime snack. Uh, emphasizing not to skip the bedtime snacks and not to give a long gap no more than 10 hours without eating from the last meal to the first meal. So refined sugars, juices, sports, and energy drinks, processed uh, um, you know, cereal, and instant potatoes, and noodles, all these are anything that's instant pretty much goes instantly to, into your blood. So we um, wanna emphasize to either limit or avoid these kind of foods. Uh, Non-starchy vegetables, I would say in liberal amounts. I don't really put any um, amount for that as much as you want. The more fiber, the better. And fats, um, at least six or more portions per day. Um, not really counting, but you know, I just tell them uh, spare, just enough, but not overdoing on having fried foods and extra butter, extra lard, or whatever it is. But it's limiting, making sure you're talking to them about limiting the saturated fat and emphasizing uh, monounsaturated fats like avocados and nuts and seeds. Avoiding trans fats, obviously, and um, include always, as we talked about, an individualist, individualized, realistic meal plan. So the recommendations are. Uh, basically, uh, three meals, three to small, four snacks. And at some point, if somebody is an oral medication still, um, and you know, some of them are still doing glyburide and things, uh, and if they have a lot many lows uh, based on the sugar numbers, you, some of them might end up more than four snacks. So, like I said, it's not a golden meal plan, so you have to really base it on what the sugars look like. But a good rule of thumb is three meals and three to four uh, snacks per day. A consistent schedule, making sure they're trying to eat at equal time, equal interval, so of time around the same time to not avoid to avoid any large fluctuations in sugars. 
avoiding more than 10 hours between bedtime snack and breakfast because anytime there's a long gap, we want to explain them what the liver does is it starts pouring out a lot more sugar to compensate for not enough circulating uh, sugars in the system. So this rebounds of sugar from the liver can show up as high fasting numbers. So that's something that you want to emphasize uh, about, especially about like adding a bedtime snack if you had early dinner. And synchronizing uh, meals snacks and oral medications and insulin is very important. Uh, adequate nutrient intake, uh, la reading labels for carbohydrates, so they might take a little while, but you know, encourage your patients to bring in what they eat to save the labels and so they can get it for fall off so you can discuss that. And uh, encourage food pattern management, uh, highly encouraging logging in food. Um, so encouraging pattern management. So if you sometimes we have patients freaking out and they you know they text you, they call you, saying, "Oh my God, I'm getting scared because my number was like 140 after a meal or 138. I'm freaking out." So just a explaining them and you know uh, that it's all about pattern management. One isolated high number is okay, but we're looking at a pattern every day high at fasting or every day high after a particular meal is that's when we have to start looking at where we need to fix some things now the carbohydrates um uh, what are source what are the sources of carbohydrates uh so we're gonna these are some of the highlights some some of the things that i'm going to touch base but this is some uh, of the good educational points for your patients and how uh, how does it impact blood sugars uh, uh, and it does obviously impact more than proteins or fats. Uh, so basically it's a good one, to, the first meeting or the first class if you've had for gestational diabetes is to focus on uh, the function of macronutrients and how each one of them impact your blood sugars. So uh, the recommended dietary allowances, um, uh, a dietary allowance for is ad adequate for 97 to 98 percent of women and pregnancy is about uh, 175 grams per day lactation is about 210 grams per day uh, the estimated average requirement which is the ear is adequate for 50 percent of women and the pre-pregnancy is about 135 grams per day and lactation is about 160 grams per day I'm not going to go into detail about this exchange information. You can see that this is very common. So if you are a dietitian, you've probably seen it a bazillion times. But um, this is just tells you different groups, um, uh, categorized to starch, food, milk, vegetables, meat, and fat. And it tells you across the table how many grams of carbs, protein, fat, and calories you get. So this could be a good one to add in the packet for the new GDM so that they know or the new patients to know as to where they're getting uh, the carbs or the protein or the fat. So uh, a good one to emphasize. So just to go a little bit about that is uh, what is serving sizes? Um, not going in detail, but people have always wondered what is serving size? They say, I eat a whole bowl of uh, rice and I thought I ate a serving size, but that actually could be like four or five serving sizes. So uh, one starch, what we say is one starch is like one slice of bread or one to six inches of tortilla or six saltines. Uh, so if you have food models or any kind of uh, uh, pictures, feel free to use that because the more visuals they see, the better they can retain what a serving size would look like. Um, or encourage them to bring their own food. And I have some patients sometimes they bring in a, in a bag what they eat and you can talk about that. Uh, one milk, about eight ounces, is one serving uh, of storage, but it also has protein. Three-fourth cup of a plain yogurt, not the added uh, sugar one or the flavored one. Uh, is one serving of starch, one fruit, a small fresh fruit, a size of a tennis ball, that's about one starch. So uh, like I said, there's a whole lot of material on this in the American Dietetic and the Diabetes Association. So feel free to use that. Now, one carb, so we, we want to focus this to the patients that you can trade off this carbs any way you want. It's interchangeably used. So one carb could be a one bread could be equal to a one milk or one fruit. All of them are 15 grams of carb. 
right? So we're talking about total grams of 175 grams during pregnancy. So you can actually be including a bread and a fruit and a pasta or milk and a yogurt, and those all are considered carbs. So label reading is very important for carbs. You're looking at a serving size, total grams of carbs, uh, total carbohydrates in grams, and the fiber and the calories and fat. So just looking at a real um, a whole wheat bread uh, example here, always check uh, serving size. Um, uh, always check if it is low in fat and cholesterol and check for it should be high in fiber. So typically I tell them, you know, if you can find a single digit carb, double digit protein kind of a label, that's the best one. You can find that in high protein um, foods. But if you look at here in the extreme left side, always look at the nutrition facts. A serving size here is, is one slice and a servings per container is like obviously 18 slices. Each serving, so everything that's listed here on the left-hand side is of the label is based on one serving. So if you ate one slice of bread, you get 80 calories. So you can see listed under calories from fat is only 10. So how do you know it's low fat? So if you take the total calories from fat and divide it by total calories, should be um, times 100, it should be less than 30%. So here, if you take 10 calories from fat divided by 80, which is total calories, times 100, that should be, obviously, this is a low-fat cal cal calorie food. So that's how you figure out if it's a low-fat. And cholesterol, we want to make sure it's zero milligrams, so it's low-fat. So in a day, we are talking about no, no more than 300 milligrams of cholesterol per day. Uh, so this is obviously a low cholesterol product. Then you're looking at the fat, it's 1.5 grams. But important to see where is that fat coming from? If it's mainly saturated fat, it's probably adding in more saturation. It's not a good thing to, a uh, good choice. So you want to make sure that it's more from the polyunsaturated of the more monounsaturated. So, um, so this probably here you can see it's zero everywhere, but it could be um, a little bit of trace amounts of you know a mix of both. Uh, and then you can see um, the total carbohydrate here is 17 grams. So meaning that remember from the uh, from what we talked about, if you have five grams of fiber per serving, that's a high fiber food. So you would assume uh, you would subtract half of the five fiber from the total grams of carb, that would be a net carb. So in this case, subtracting about 2.5 grams of fiber from 17, which I believe is 14.5 grams of carb, that would be a net carbs. So always look for at least five grams of fiber. If it is two or three grams of fiber, it's very negligible. I won't even bother subtracting that. So, so this is just a good example. I would not worry about the person daily value on the right-hand side. It's based on 2,000 calories. The focus is more towards um, to the left-hand side. So um, uh, how, I hope this kind of, kind, of, kind of made it a little bit easier for you guys to look through uh, the labels and explain it to the patients. Now, some of the gar carb guidelines that really works for people would be uh, uh, breakfast, if you space it to 15 to 30 grams, which could be one to two carb choices or servings. Lunch, about 30 to 60 grams, two to four carb choices. Dinner, about 30 to 60 grams, two to four carb choices. And snacks, about 15 to 30 grams, one to two carb choices. So if you had a singleton pregnancy, um, in my experience, what we're good and what I do normally is about try to do a 30 grams at breakfast, 45 and 45 grams each at dinner, and about 15 grams for each snack. Unless, you, like I said, it's not a golden meal plan. You have to really base it on what the, uh, uh, based on everyday basis as to what the sugar looks like. But if you had somebody came in with triplets or uh, uh, twins, obviously your, your grams of carbs is going to be a little bit more based on the need at that point. Now, I'm um, not going to go into detail into this, but you can see the distribution of carbs for 175 to 180 grams, which is about 12 carb choices. You can see in the extreme left is the food groups. 
uh, which is listed in here on the, and across the table uh, are the breakfast, snack, lunch, and snack, and dinner and snack, and a total of uh, grams of carbs. So it kind of gives you a general idea as to how you can distribute the carbs throughout the day to make it to 175 to 180 grams. So you can feel free to use this if it kind of makes your life easier. Uh, so I just put this in because this is a good example of snacking and gestational diabetes. So the next two, this end slide and the next slide, it tells you about what is one carb choice, which is about 15 grams of carbs. So you can see, for example, one uh, bread, one slice of bread, white or whole wheat or rye is like one 15 grams. So it kind of gives you a quick uh, approach to, you know, it can be used as a good resource for the patients to say, hey, you can do, these could be used as one 15 gram or one carb choice snacks and combining it with the protein. So this and the next slide, like I said, uh, feel free. So these are the two pages that you can use that for uh, examples for that. Now glycemic index really quick um, is very important. Uh, so glycemic index, uh, the use of glycemic index diet reduced the need for uh, insulin for women in GDM, as research suggests. Uh, there's, no comp there's no compromise in obstetric or fetal outcomes, and it was well tolerated. So what is glycemic in index? Basically, if you were to look at a sweet potato versus a white potato, uh, if both of them are 15 grams, the sweet potato a uh, white potato goes in your blood really fast and crashes down fast, while the sweet potato kind of um, goes a little slower into your blood and kind of clamp, comes down a little slower. So meaning it lasts for a longer time. So what it means is uh, the same amounts of food can react differently in your blood. So um, there are tons of information on low glycemic index foods, like I said, in the ADA websites. And you can feel free to print that out. But this is something which would be highly useful, especially for someone who is on, who's, a, uh, who's uh, using insulin to carb ratio, who's on multiple daily injections, or a type one uh, diabetic. So now talking uh, about supplementation, um, guidelines for special circumstances. Sorry, I think I did skip. Something. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, what about fats and proteins? Going back. Uh, fats uh, do slow down um, um, stomach emptying and the potential for, uh, but if you were to eat up, it's not going to affect the sugars, but uh, if you were to eat, consume that in excess, um, uh, it, it is it is going to add excess calories and it's going to add up to uh, um, to into the weight gain. So you want to be careful about how you spread this fat out uh, in the meal pattern. And protein, uh, the secretion, insulin secretion is uh, very similar to uh, is similar to carbohydrate. So the glucose from ingested protein does not appear in um, circulation. So the proteins have a notable impact on uh, glucose homeostasis mechanisms. Uh, predominantly through their effects on uh, insulin, incretins, uh, gluconeogenesis, and gastric empty. So, um, so if you were to have, for example, a high protein meal like a steak and had a little potato or a pizza, uh, the first week, uh, first sorry, week, I'm talking about first hour uh, or a couple of hours, your sugars look great, or even in fact could be lower. But then after three, four hours down the lane, you uh, the sugars are spiking up and you're like, where is this coming from? So uh, that's where you want to be careful about because the protein is like a holding block. So uh, meaning if you had large amounts of protein to start with, it's holding the carb and it releases that into the system after two, three hours. So you might have to, if someone on insulin or someone on um, insulin pump, you can talk about the, you know, uh, the features of uh, dual management or extended, uh, you know, the dual management system where you can split the insulin doses um, or, you know, if you're doing MDI, you can talk to that effect if the pa patient is ready to absorb that. But just keeping in mind that increased amount of protein can also, um, you know, alter the sugar numbers two, three hours after. 
now coming to the MNT goal for special circumstances. So switching gears, this is uh, more focused to the bariatric surgery. So I've done a lot of talks on the bariatric surgery and people have always asked, and I can see a lot of providers are actually now seeing a lot more of this population in their, uh, in their, in their workplace. So um, I thought I could add a little bit and touch on that, not going into very detail about the surgical procedures, but just a little bit of MNT goals. So one of the MNT goals basically depends a lot on the kind of surgery, but the, the more pronounced goals are to facilitate adequate weight to promote fetal growth. You know, when patients come from the bariatric surgery, and especially if they get pregnant in the first year, which is considered to be the rapid weight loss phase, and here they are trying to gain back weight. So not only there is a lot of uh, nutrition uh, deficiencies or nutrition adjustments to be done, there's a whole lot of emotional factor to be addressed too. So having a team, I would say, would be a good of like, you know, therapists and also to involve the surgeon, dietitian, OBs. But bottom line, we are trying to see that we facilitate, um, you know, the adequate weight to promote fetal growth and to provide vitamin and uh, mineral supplementation and uh, to correct or um, prevent any kind of a deficiency. And the other goal being to assess nutrition education needs during pregnancy and uh, lactation. So some of the um, prenatal, uh, what, some of the supplementation for the very this population um, is directly, I would say, depends a whole lot on what kind of surgery you had. Uh, malabsorptive surgery like bypass, duodenal switch might need um, more of uh, double amounts of prenatal vitamin or more supplementation. But um, as long as you have the prenatal uh, multivitamin every day, that should be su sufficient. Mostly like a sleeve or, um, you know, like a bypass, uh, the, like the banding. Uh, typically we say that a prenatal vitamin every day should be okay. But like I said, again, um, it is all based on the pre um, pregnancy lab or during the pregnancy lab and making sure the surgeon and the team uh, is involved in the team and uh, uh, look at uh, that they need to have a lot more blood draws to see that they're not deficient in any any kind of a, uh, you know, vitamin or mineral during the pregnancy. And DHA about 300 milligrams per day or in combination with prenatal vitamins. Uh, calcium citrate with uh, vitamin D is emphasized with uh, 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams per day. Um, so uh, vitamin D, uh, make sure that it is in the form of a citrate, not carbonate. Uh, citrate is absorbed much better and it can be taken in empty stomach than carbonate is slow absorbed. It has to be taken with food. Um, and also B12. So a lot of the malabsorptive procedures like the bypass, the ruin Y, or the diagonal, so it's a lot of them bypass uh, the part of the stomach where there's a lot more of the absorption of B12 that's happening uh, because there's a lot of intrinsic factor in the digestive enzymes are lost, uh, pushing uh, B12 supplementation to at least a 500 to 1,000 micrograms sublingual under the tongue. Uh, every other day or a thousand micrograms intramuscular per every month is recommended. And iron um, as needed uh, based on the labs, I would say. So they need to be, you have to make sure that they are getting the labs done. And if you suspect that there's some kind of a deficiency happening, maybe even to involve the surgeon to have the labs done would be appropriate. So the dietary goals for them is a minimum, uh, we're talking about the bariatric surgery, minimum 60 grams of protein per day, about 0.75 grams uh, uh, per kilogram of body weight, plus additional six grams per day, 64 ounces of calorie-free calorie fluids a day, and about three meals and two protein-containing snacks a day. If they are hungry and if they need, trying to focus a lot more uh, protein-only kind of snack during the day. Uh, never go um, uh, more than four hours without eating, and I'm going to, uh, uh, because it is, they, because of the procedure, the stomach is reduced to a small portion, the toleration is reduced, so you, you want to make sure it's small but frequent meals. Uh, avoid simple carbs, especially on this empty pouch. 
Um, so one of the reasons is dumping. Uh, it cre it creates because when you're trying to do simple carbs, it uh, um, you know it creates dumping and it creates huge fluctuations in blood levels. So the dumping uh, results are the nausea, vomiting, which we're talking about. It results from accelerated gastric emptying of hyperosmolar content into the duodenum or small bowel followed by fluid shifts uh, from the intravascular compartment into the intestinal lumen. So symptoms appear about maybe 10 to uh, 60 minutes after food intake, which include uh, like abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea, fatigue, and palpitations. So the late dumping can occur uh, one to three hours after a meal when a hyperinsulinemic response to ingested carbs produce postprandial reactive hypoglycemia. That's why we emphasize on not um, having this population go through the oral glucose tolerance test to screen for um, the stage no diabetes. And uh, utilizing protein shakes in early, uh, if early satiety can be, uh, is recommended and decreased intake um, uh, is an issue. Uh, separate solids and liquid foods intake. So a lot of this population um, is prone to a lot of heartburns. So to avoid the GERD issue, uh, try not mixing the solids and liquid foods together. So at least, you know, taking the liquids 15 minutes before the meal or 16 minutes after unless they're choking, um, you know, that's what is the recommendation for this population. And the gastric band uh, patients may need uh, to uh, completely deflate band. So if they're really having a hyperemesis, um, they might have to get their, um, you know, um, you know, band uh, loosened a little bit. If they're gaining way too much weight, maybe their band needs to be tightened a little bit. So that's where uh, the surgeon comes into play. So you want to keep them, uh, him or her, in the team. Now, the weight gain uh, studies indicate that bariatric patients usually have a significantly lower maternal weight gain. Um, it's about 3.7 kilograms versus 15.6 kilograms in the general obese population without the bariatric surgery. The other reports have reported that there's also decreased incidence of complications compared to the obese uh, controls. So some may still continue, like I was talking about, to lose weight, especially if they're in the first year of rapid weight loss phase, um, and if, if they're still overweight and they're losing weight. So uh, close monitoring of fetal growth is highly recommended at this point. So some of the things I really put this down, I thought it's, it's useful. You can find that in the CDAP our website. It's all listed in here. Uh, I love this and I've always included this in our, our first packet for the GDM and it gives an overview of which is called my plate for gestational diabetes. It just tells you, highlights more about the macronutrients, tells you uh, what is protein, what are fruits and what is the serving size. And the next page, it tells you about my nutrition plan for gestational diabetes, talking about the plate method and just options for breakfast and lunch and how you balance the and the snack options as well. So feel free to use this and print it out and give it as a resource to your patients. So in summary, uh, the goals of reassessment would be weight gain within recommended weights. Uh, keeping in mind the special circumstance population like the bariatric surgery that we talked about. Uh, so again, uh, focusing, uh, it's not only the weight gain, we also look at the rate of weight gain or the weight loss. So basically, uh, summary is we're looking at the weight management during pregnancy. And balanced meal plan based on individualized needs. Uh, keeping in mind that people come from different cultures and beliefs and needs, so want to make sure it's more evidence-based and balanced uh, meal for them. And uh, these meal plans are tweaked, can be tweaked uh, anyway, based on the parameters. And meal plan comprehension. So uh, like if you might have to still, you know, some, some of the patients might be ready to do insulin to carb ratio. Uh, but some might still be, you know, struggling to know what is a carbohydrate. So you have to make sure they're ready for that and looking at what the comprehension level is and base your uh, counseling uh, based on that, uh, that need. 
and also scheduling appropriate appointments. Some of you have the liberty to do that once every week. It could be once a week or once in three weeks or four weeks or five weeks, but definitely once a month is recommended uh, based on uh, the glycemic control. And also highly recommend, you know, keep or uh, maintain a follow-up with the patients in, uh, via phone or text. So whatever means uh, you can. And the weight gain are measured and plotted. Like I said, use the weight gain grids, which is found in CDAP website. Uh, weight loss, always make sure weight loss is very common during the first MNT, first two MNT visits. So if the patients are panicking, explaining them the first visit that uh, since you're changing your diet, the diuresis, there's water weight gone. So that shows up as weight loss. Uh, and not to worry because after second MNT visit, you start to pick up. Awaken. And it's true of somebody who is obese because they're trying to eat healthy now, so they might lose a little extra weight. That's why I say as long as the baby is growing fine, ultrasounds look good, and she is doing perfectly what you ask her to do, uh, everything should be good. And the uh, food intake, highly encourage food intake patterns, in, uh, it would be from food records or 24-hour recall. Uh, you know, trying to compare, you know, uh, original with the uh, 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 with the original meal plan, like how they used to eat, and see how sometimes when patients are seeing what they used to eat before and what they eat now, they learn a lot from them saying, "Aha, uh -huh, this is what I did, and now it's working." So, and it kind of stays with them lifelong, and they kind of tend to adapt to those kind of behaviors. All right, so this comes to. Um, the end of my presentation and I know it's a whole lot of uh, you know topics that I covered today but if you have any questions please feel free to send out um, questions and that could be forwarded out to me appreciate any comments or anything and I would really want to thank all of you for listening through uh, this and uh, like I said again um, if you have any questions you know where to reach all right, all of you have a wonderful day and stay safe.